Coming up this week, Anthropic reveals a new way to use artifacts, why AI could cause the price of SaaS products to plummet, a new tool that transforms how you work with products like Slack, Notion, and Google Drive, and LinkedIn CEO shares some surprising usage stats for AI features. As always, if you enjoy the briefing, hit the subscribe and the like button. So first up this week, Anthropic has released a new feature that lets you create a dedicated space for the mini apps it calls artifacts created with Claude. These apps can now also include Claude's AI capabilities through APIs, but crucially, if a user interacts with it, the app will use their credits, not the creators. Anthropic says that early users have already used this to build mini apps, including data analysis apps, where users upload CSVs and ask, ask follow up questions in natural language, AI powered games, learning tools, and more. So, if you're somebody who's used Claude's artifacts feature in the past, but were reluctant to share it with other users just in case you got hit by API bills, then check that one out. And continuing the theme of mini apps, Airtable this week has announced a major relaunch. After previously competing with the likes of Google Sheets and Notion through its spreadsheet and database management, it will now relaunch as an AI-powered mini-app builder focused on helping consumers and builders build lightweight apps that they can use at work and at home. So the self-made mini-app industry is currently booming. And on the face of it, this move by Airtable does make sense. But clearly, there's a lot at stake here. Airtable has raised over $1.3 in funding so far. And reading between the lines, it's likely that its original value proposition wasn't strong enough to compete with incumbents. And as more people build these mini apps, the price of niche enterprise grade SaaS could plummet. Replit CEO this week said that this is having a major impact on the types of prices that vendors are able to charge. So in one example, he said that a user at a company was quoted $150,000 to create an ERP automation, but instead decided to build it themselves. And as a result, they spent $400 on the process instead. So here's a visualization of this in context. But what should we call this new emerging type of software development? OpenAI's co-founder and the creator of the term Vibe Coding spoke at a Y Combinator last week about the future of software. And according to him, the era of software 3.0 has begun. In this era, prompts act as the new programming language, shifting how we interact with computers. Access is primarily through cloud-based time-shared models. LLMs are people spirits, he says, with superhuman knowledge in some areas, but prone to errors, hallucinations, and memory limitations. This means that they require careful design to mitigate security risks, and that ultimately digital infrastructure and documentation will be designed for both human humans and AI agents. LLM-friendly formats like Markdown and protocols will help agents interact effectively with software and data. So this talk at Y Combinator touches upon all kinds of different aspects of this new era of software. So if you're interested in learning more about that, then check out that talk. In other news this week, Perplexity has announced that it will now let you schedule tasks on WhatsApp. So for example, you could ask it for regular updates on specific topics every week or every morning. For product teams, this could be useful for things like getting industry news updates or competitor intelligence. Perplexity CEO also teased the release of their upcoming AI browser, but we're still actually waiting on a release date for that. But whilst we wait, a consensus does seem to be emerging that whoever owns the AI browser will own the concept of AI memory. Speaking on X, the founder of Mixpanel said that whoever owns the first AI browser will win AI memory long term. The browser is the closest approximation of humanity's memory that we have. In the replies, it's not surprising to see the founder of Dear Browser say that he agrees 100%. And on the topic of perplexity, if you're interested in learning more about how to use perplexity's new labs feature, over on Substack this week, I get hands-on with perplexity labs and explore how you can use it at work for things like data analysis and visualizations, product strategy and differentiation, user research analysis, understanding technical concepts, and more. So if you're interested in learning more about how to use perplexity labs at work, then check out this week's knowledge series over on the Substack. Now let's take a look at some tools you can use. And first up is a product that I came across this week called Pointer. And this is a new way to guide users through your product onboarding. So as you can see, Pointer uses a large pointer, as you'd expect, to help users with onboarding and complex workflows. So as you can see, as a user is using the product, this pointer will direct them to the relevant place they need to be, to various parts of the product to understand how it works. And actually, this, this actually looks pretty helpful, and it's not something that I've seen done before. I've seen little pop-ups and tooltips, but I've never seen it quite in this way using a pointer. The downside of this, of course, could be that UX designers become a little bit lazy, and instead of building something that's naturally intuitive, they may think to themselves, well, let's just switch on the pointer and let the pointer direct people in the right direction. Nevertheless, I do think this is really interesting, and if you're looking for new ways to onboard users in your own product, then check out Pointer. Next is a product called Napkin, 
And I've mentioned Napkin before in the past, but this week they've announced a whole new set of features which gives users greater customization options about the visuals that it generates. If you've not used Napkin before, it essentially scans a bunch of text and then creates different types of visuals that complement that text. The visuals themselves can be a little bit sketchbooky, which may not be suitable for all types of documents. But this new version lets you customize exactly the types of visual that you need. So you can choose flowcharts, mind maps, tables, or anything else. You can specify your preferred orientation, control visual depth, and also edit your own text as well. So if you're looking for new ways to add visuals to your presentations, then I would definitely recommend checking out Napkin. And the final product this week is a startup that this week raised over $30 million from Menlo Ventures for its AI-powered dictation app. Flow is essentially a dictation app, but the difference here is that this dictation app will work across every single product that you use. They say that this is four times faster than typing and it can be used across a whole bunch of different products. And in their use cases, they say that this is suitable for things like customer support, designers, product managers, lawyers, and more. So here's a demo of that in action. Awesome, fire emoji. I can even use it to help me build out code. Can you help me write a component that will create a nice celebration animation when the user completes their onboarding? And it just keeps me in my flow. Now let's move on to some data and trends from the week. And the first question is, has Microsoft reached peak employees? The company has announced a fresh round of layoffs in the past week, which coincide with the wider rollout of AI at the company. But is AI actually to blame? If we take a look at this graph, you can see there are three core stages of this graph. The first is in the zero interest rate policy stage or the so-called ZERP phase, which as you can see is where employees grew from 170,000 all the way up to just under 220,000. And then in the get fit stage is where we started to see some layoffs. Since then in the AI chapter, we've seen another spike in hiring, but this has started to decline since Microsoft announced that 30% of code is now generated by AI. Is this causation or correlation? Nobody's quite sure, but this could just be a temporary blip along the way, but it's something definitely worth keeping an eye on. Another company who has announced more layoffs is Bumble, and this week they confirmed that they are set to lay off over 30% of their workforce. This impacts around 240 positions, and following the news, the company's shares shot up 20%. Now, we don't know if this was directly impacted by AI at all, but it's definitely a sign of the times that companies are increasingly focused on average revenue per employee. And speaking of online dating, this week a new set of consumer apps have entered the charts with a novel twist on dating and matchmaking thanks to AI. So these work by generating an AI pencil drawing of your potential soulmates. So you enter in information about yourself and then off the back of it, it generates a pencil based drawing of what their partner could look like. Users can then use these as potential templates in the real world to find their matchmaker. Now these have both entered the top 10 charts this week and the company charges $15 a month to do this. Now we don't know what the retention of a product like this might be, but more importantly, what might the unintended consequences of this might be? If users rely mostly on the drawings of what their potential partner should look like, then this could have all sorts of strange consequences for the types of people that users will allow into their dating pools. What do you think? Is this something that you would use? Let me know in the comments below. Elsewhere this week, a new report from a VC firm shows us just how quickly AI is transforming the consumer product space. Now, this report is over 100 pages long, but it does have some interesting nuggets. And some of these that I found interesting include the fact that OpenAI's 40 billion funding round is bigger than all of the top fundraisers from 2018 to 2024 combined. So that just puts into perspective the scale of the amount of money that OpenAI has raised. But seeing we work on here is a timely reminder that just because you raise money doesn't mean that you're ultimately going to win in the end. Elsewhere in this report, it shows that AI coding startups are now generating 1.3 billion in revenue more than this time last year, and AI companies are generating revenues at record speed. Anthropic took 21 months to reach $1 billion, but only three months to then double it to $2 billion. The report also shows that ChatGPT is averaging 29 minutes of attention a day, and as you can see here, it is slowly catching up with Instagram and TikTok surpassing Snapchat and Pinterest. So ultimately, tools like ChatGPT could really eat into the number of minutes an average user spends on social media. The report also shows that AI features are quickly becoming the standard for products. So in this slide, you can see that 51% of Notion sales now include AI bolt-ons. But not everyone is convinced about the prospect of AI features. And this week, LinkedIn CEO said that their new writing assistant 
isn't as popular as their CEO expected to be. The barrier is much higher to posting on LinkedIn because he says, this is your resume online. So personally, I view this as a rare win against the proliferation of AI slop across social media, but it's also an interesting insight into how and when users are comfortable using AI. We know from previous surveys that users are reluctant to share with their boss that they've used AI at work. And I guess in many ways, this is just an extension of that. What do you think? Would you use AI to write messages on LinkedIn? Or would you be a little bit embarrassed? Let me know in the comments below. And finally this week, forget about vibe coding. GenSparks CEO says that there's a new trend in town and he calls this vibe working. So vibe working, according to him, is a new way of organizing your work that moves away from strict predefined workflows and instead relies upon autonomous agents to handle tasks. And the use cases for this at work are pretty wild. Their CEO says that in Japan, for example, some users are using AI agents for all sorts of things, including breaking up with their partners or even resigning from their jobs. So whenever the next time you think about changing jobs, maybe it's something you could outsource to an AI agent. And on that note, thanks very much for listening and watching. I'll be back next week with another briefing.